I'm Benji. Uh, as you can tell from the talk, this is a journey I took from being an agile coach to VP product. Uh, thank you for staying around. I'm in the graveyard slot before the bar or before your travels home. This is giving you a whirlwind uh, 30 minutes. So hopefully everyone will take something back from this that's at least useful to their day jobs, where that job may be. Um, I'm going to walk through 12 steps. Everyone's got a number, right? And we're going to go 12 today. Uh, before I get into it, I stole these slides from an open source person, thank you, with lots of little robots, giving credit where credit's due. Uh, also, I'm from South London, so if you're not from the area, I have an accent, I speak quite quickly. Please, if I'm going too, too fast, just put your hand up so I slow down. I get overexcited and that's what happens. Uh, and let's get going. So I'm going to talk about me very quickly and briefly. Uh, and there's about four ways that being a coach taught me how to be a good leader. I'm going to do four lessons that being a product manager taught me about power. Four things I specifically thought about when moving into product leadership. So if you're a product manager or in product, I want to try and make that jump, what to think about. And then once I got there, what did I focus on to make sure I was, I was any good at the job? Uh, and if at the end you want to ask me questions, either face to face, here, outside, or via Twitter, you're more than welcome and I'll happily answer them. Let's jump in. Um, start my about me's with things I'm rubbish at. If you haven't built one of these docs, I recommend it. Uh, I share it with all my colleagues who I work with. It tells me I'm terrible in the mornings, I'm dyslexic, I have ADHD. It's often more helpful to say that than the things you're good at, which you'll find quite hard. Um, in terms of my career, I started off as a high school mathematics teacher, 11 to 18, uh, and then happened to move into sales, and ended up in UK government doing technology for a place called GDS, and a few places after that. Um, and really, this quote from Steve Jobs, which is from a commencement speech at Stanford, I think, you might have all seen it already, about the dots in your life only working in reverse is certainly true for me. I didn't plan any part of that journey, um, but all those jobs I had taught me skills that are crucial for what I do today. Honestly, agile coaching and high school maths, very similar jobs. <laughs> uh, I then became a product manager. I'll talk about that switch. Um, this is a very short talk. People know more about it. I have written a few blogs about that. Uh, and then same moving to product. Wrote a blog around that recently. So if you want to learn more, check me out, have a read and ask questions. And again, happy to debate any of the topics in there. Just one person's opinion. So let's jump in. Coaching. So let's jump back to 2016. Uh, Sia was top of the charts. Drake's always there or thereabouts. Um, I had been offered, I was, probably, I was working at NHS in the UK uh, for their digital team, building fun environments like this as an agile coach, trying to visualize workflows and all the things coaches do in this world. Uh, I got an offer to go and work at Spotify in New York. My wife was American, she already moved over there. Um, I was super pumped to go and do this, somewhere I always wanted to work. I've always been a, a, a fanboy of, of what maybe it entails. I wanted to go and see what it was for real. And I remember so vividly getting my business card, which sounds weird, but business card made it feel very real. Until that point, I had real imposter syndrome about me being there. And then I got a business card that gave me a little boost. Okay, they can't take it away from me. I've got, got a card to prove it now. Give one to my mum, etc. And I learned so much um, about being successful in my current role as a product lead from being an agile coach. Honestly, so lucky to have had that experience. I'm going to walk through just four things, but I could do hours and hours in, in the pub about this if you want to hear more. I'll talk through four things from assuming positive intent by leading by influence. So with this room, it may be obvious about assuming positive intent. I definitely had heard the phrase before going to coaching, but I would not say I was an expert. I would not say I was living that world. I was definitely still someone who dropped into the blame culture quite often. Someone was like, oh, person X is a dick. I'm like, yeah, person X is a dick, quite, quite naturally. Um, I don't know if that's something I'll be proud of or not, but that, that was where I was coming from. Um, I'd say in many ways I passed the coach bar just about going into, into the Spotify. Uh, and I was really lucky that some people sat me down. I said, hey, like, you're doing this thing. You can't do this thing if you want to be a coach. When someone comes to you and says that, you can't agree with them. <laughs> Okay, you need to coach them to maybe think about it differently. And if you aren't doing it yourself in your life, you ain't going to be able to coach it in someone else. And for those who haven't come across it before, is assuming that people have genuine and well-meaning where they're coming from in their, their part of a conversation and their story. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a really key tenet in any part of leadership. And it's something I try and do today in every meeting, in every interaction. Apart from maybe in my spare time in the pub, I might 
might have that little vent, everyone needs a vent occasionally, but certainly in my job, I try and do it all the time. Number two was around trusting by default. Um, I actually spent a lot of time Googling this phrase and found it wasn't really as popular as I thought it would be. Um, there's two different real trust profiles out there. One is people start on zero and they build up. Uh, traditionally, 30, 40 years ago, you maybe make the tea and then maybe given small tasks and eventually your trust builds up. Or there is all the trust on day one, it's yours to lose. Now, hopefully you don't lose it like this graph is showing, to be clear, um, but at least you start up there on one. And for the work that I do, I've been in hyperscaling startups now for the last six years. There's really no other option apart from trusting by default. Okay, people who haven't got time with, or they're just scaling so quickly, do anything other than this. And where it doesn't happen, so many problems occur. Thirdly, it was all around communities. I'm sure you're all better experts than I'm around this. But communities, I've never been part of one properly. I mean, I thought I had, but I hadn't until I joined Spotify as a coach. And especially in New York, I've coached about 10 people there, another sort of 40 in Stockholm. But they were able to talk about learning new skills, giving me feedback on stuff, and being a self-help group. If you haven't seen Wreck-It Ralph, I recommend it. Um, and that's exactly what I got. Like, for these three people changed my life. Um, I remember my first ever conference talk I was doing, the Apple Scrum Day. And I went to them with my talk called Bright-Eyed and Bushy-Tailed, and they went, yeah, this is shit. Um, and that was really lucky they did that. So I didn't make a fool myself on stage. Um, and they were also there to support me. They were there to teach me new skills. They try something out, they read a book, they try it out with their team, and they come back and say how it would to the rest of the group. All I had to do was turn up and listen. That was amazing. That kind of LD I'd had before in my entire life. And yeah, they were also there to vent to, because it's a really hard job and it's a really ambiguous job. And therefore, having people like that doing the same thing as you and saying, yeah, giving you a hug is actually really powerful and really important, especially when I had such a bad imposter syndrome when I started. And then, fourth on the Agile Coach piece was around leadership styles. Uh, this is probably my natural style when I grew up. Um, stand at the front, bark orders, play sports, that kind of stuff. Um, and I slowly realized I didn't want that. <laughs> and these are the type of commanders. I don't really want to be compared to Margaret Thatcher. That's not really my ideal scenario. Uh, and so I had to change myself. I had to put active effort into changing myself. Things like therapy and coaching and all the other good stuff you need to do to be an amazing coach. I had to do, and I had to learn to lead by influence. I had to learn to persuade people that what I was saying was worth listening to which I didn't realize at the time how powerful that would be in the rest of my life, but absolutely game-changing. And my personality changed. I'm not saying Myers-Briggs is everything, but it's an interesting thing to take on a regular cadence to see how you change, because the questions don't change. And I moved to more of an entertainer style. I've changed a bit again since then, but at that point, I was more like an Elton John character, and I was much happier with the Margaret Thatcher. Um, and I was able to persuade people. I was able to go at all the levels of organization, from leadership to teams to individuals, and say, hey, I, I might be able to help. Can we do some coaching? Can we talk about this thing? And they would listen. That was a skill I had to learn, because I had no position of authority. So those are the four, just for today, around coaching from what I now do as a product that I really took forward. I then ended up jumping across to product management. I wouldn't say, again, this was a planned move, it wasn't a life ambition in any capacity. Um, I was kind of happy as a coach. Some changes happened internally, but then opportunity arose. A coach had a rejection with a team, so pardon me, a, a team had a uh, rejection with a team. They came in, didn't work out. They had to then leave quickly. There's a gap. This team needed a PM. And I said, okay, I'll just do it for three months until we hire someone else. I'd previously built teams, whether they be sports teams or professional teams. I'd coached a load of PMs by this point, so I thought I had some idea of the role. And I thought, okay, like, let me do it for three months. Let me have a go at showing what I can do. One thing that was really important to me, and this is important to me today in how I behave across every facet of my job, is I didn't want to lose what I gained as a coach. I'd become a people person. I'd, I'd been really focused on making sure everyone was happy and healthy, and nothing else really trumped that. Of course, not to the nth degree, but in general as a rule. And a lot of the product managers I worked with, this wasn't true. They didn't give a fuck about the people in their teams. It was only up and to the right, and they'd burn everyone to get there. I didn't want to lose that. I got given a team, a uh, team that ran Discover Weekly. I didn't build it myself. I took it over. I was very lucky. Um, it was an absolute 
dreamed how that's your first product manager job. I was such a fan of the feature itself. I've been working with the team already as a coach. It was kind of a natural fit. And again, I learned just an incredible amount uh, in this role that will once again help them become BP product. It's not on this list, but if you haven't been a product manager, I so firmly believe you cannot manage product managers. And that sounds obvious, but I've had so many bad experiences with the, la with the, with the latter. So these are the four things that I really learned as a product manager that helped me today. Number one, measuring product manager performance. It's notoriously hard. And I'd seen so many progression of performance frameworks like this. Right, this huge spreadsheet of do these thousand things and you'll be a great product manager, which coming into the role was obviously quite intimidating. And to be honest, no one looks at it. Um, <laughs> I was super lucky. I did the job for nine months before anyone even explained anything to me around this, not even raised the question, to be perfectly honest. And then a boss of mine came in, came over from Amazon, wasn't an Amazon guy, to be honest, but super lovely. And he said, Benji, it's actually quite simple. I care about three things. I care, one, you build a high-performing team, two, get them to build something quickly, and then three, make sure that thing moves a metric someone cares about. Nothing else really matters. Get those three things right, you're gonna be a great product manager. Uh, and to this day, the, I use these where we, I currently work, I've got colleagues here who are probably smiling looking at it. Um, I did okay. Uh, I wasn't the world's best PM, wasn't the world's worst PM, but I did okay. I certainly did okay according to those three metrics. Number two was that being a product manager is fucking hard. Um, being an agile coach is, is not easy, to be clear, but I do think product management is harder. Uh, and this is why, um, for good reason, coaches aren't accountable for a lot of things, right? They're meant to be an independent person you can go to and talk about things. But as a product manager, you are accountable for everything. Um, and that pressure weighs really heavy on one's shoulders. If you're, you are a product manager or have been, you're probably nodding. If you haven't, have a go at it for at least a couple of weeks while someone's on vacation and you'll get a feel for it. Everyone looks to you all the time for everything. Uh, and with great uh, responsibility comes great power, uh, as Spider-Man so wonderfully taught us, and it is a gift and a curse. Uh, and because you haven't got this authority, similar to coaching, no one in your team reports to you. Going back to the leadership by influence, that was why it was so important for me to have learned that skill coming into this role. If I had just said to my team and my team of engineers, build this, why? Because I said so, they just turned their chairs around politely. <laughs> and that happened. Uh, we had PMs come over from places like Amazon who did that, and it just didn't work. They hadn't learned that skill of persuading people. This is not new information. Uh, so Matt wrote this article about being a janitor many, many years ago, and it's very, very accurate today. And if you are in a product leadership role, one piece of advice I can give is this. Tell your product managers just how hard it is. Like, have empathy with them, because they're probably feeling really quite lonely a lot of the time and thinking that the world's going to come down their shoulders. Um, so nothing else, just tell them, I get it. It's a really hard job. Third, power. So I certainly grew up thinking power was a bad thing to have. Um, I wasn't really comfortable with that phrase. I did an exercise called Move Motors many uh, years ago. I do it all the time now. If you haven't done this, I recommend it. And it was really hard to place this card. And it still is for lots of people today. I now find it much easier. Um, because I didn't really understand this definition of it. The power is influence. It's when, people, when you speak, people listen to you. And when that got redefined for me, I suddenly thought about it very differently. And then a friend of mine for Christmas gave me this. Uh, maybe because I was starting to abuse my power, so I wasn't really aware of the power I'd then been given. Um, and the power paradox goes even more scientific how I describe it. Power defines one's capacity towards another person's condition or state of mind. Now, I come from this coaching background where all I was doing, it turns out, was really like having power on people, but I'd only be using it for good. And another day in a pub, we could argue about how you could use coaching for bad if you wanted to, but that's probably the test you do when you interview someone for the job. But I certainly was now, okay, actually I do want power and I'm comfortable saying it out loud. I got this role as a product manager and I started to feel quite comfortable with it. And also the pressure that comes with it because pressure does funny things to people. I've learned that time and time again in the roles I've had since and in this role. And it's not for everyone. Lots of people don't want power, they don't want that pressure and learning that was really key. Um, but learning that I liked it and more than that, I felt comfortable I wouldn't misuse it because I had this coaching background, this people first orientation, 
I thought, okay, I think better than most people, I'm going to try and use this power for good. And I also realized I could still sleep at night. A lot of people aren't able to do that with the pressure being applied of being a product manager. And this is really important for then going on to the next stage of product leadership as well. It was a big relief, I must say. So I thought I was ready. I thought I knew a bit. I thought I was ready to go on. I thought I was ready to be a head of product. I thought I was ready to, uh, to run my own team, to plant my own flag. I'd learned a load. I'd had some bad experiences with managers, some good experiences with managers. I thought, right, I want to go and find somewhere I can do this myself. I had a couple of pit stops. Now there, I do a whole story about this as well. A uh, place called Monzo, a fintech bank in London. And also Hawkfish, which was a campaign against Trump in New York before the elections. And then I ended up at a small health tech company called Accurex right here in London. I've been talking to them for a little while and I said, hey, I'm on the market, can I make something work? And the rest is history, although I'm gonna tell you about it right now. So in case you wonder who they are, it is a small health tech company trying to fix communication across the NHS right now. Um, it's quite a big problem to solve, everyone here who's been involved in it. Um, it's about 170 people now. This is a slightly old photo to give you a kind of a idea of the size of the problem. When I joined, it was 30 people. Um, and so there's four things. If you're trying to make that move, if you are a product manager, and you're thinking, okay, I want to be a product leader, whatever title that may hold. Here are four things that I did quite deliberately. And this was kind of one of the first times I was quite deliberate in my career. After that moment I had as a product manager, where I went, I'm ready to plant my own flag and be in power, from that moment onwards, everything else was much more deliberate than previous parts of my life. And these are the four things I want to talk about today quickly. So one is make your ambitions clear, but be taking your hands dirty. Two, get product managers reporting into you. Three, check they live their values as a company. And then four, make sure you can actually succeed. So first of all, set the stage. I said to them, hey, I'm on the market. I'd love to come and work for you. We talked about it a bit before. You're doing great stuff. I want to be ahead of product. They said, cool, we don't want one of those. We haven't got one, we don't need one. Maybe later. So, okay, what do you need? He said, we've just gone from one team to four teams and delivery is broken and we have no idea how to fix it. I guess you do. Would you be an agile coach for us? I said, look, I've, I've kind of done that stage of my career. I'm on a new path now, but maybe I can make something work. I don't mind helping you fix that, but also I'll try and get to my own career goals and what I'm trying to do. And they offered me a job and they said, you can be the product delivery lead. That was kind of their, their, their offer. And I think, I don't know, maybe it's revisionist history. I think I was reasonably clever in how I approached this. Uh, so I said, thanks for that. We can make this work. We're in the right lines. Uh, but how about one of these three roles? Well, the first role, they had no directors of the company on LinkedIn. So I'm guessing they weren't giving me that job. Secondly, the role I really wanted, product lead, because it's quite an easy jump from product lead into head of product. That's quite a, a well-traveled path I was asking for. But I was also comfortable with them giving me this, that clever little and, the ampersand there, very different um, from product delivery lead. And then thirdly though, or fourthly, made sure to state my intentions. Okay, I was clear, I op open cards, I don't mind doing this, but I want to be the head of product in the future. If that role comes available, I want to be like, considered for it straight away. And so we settled on product and delivery lead, and we were away. It was going to be a hybrid role between the two things. Uh, and I was like, no worries. I'm happy to go and prove myself. Time and time again in my life, and I'm sure some of you in this room, the ability to go and prove yourself, if you trust the people, they will promote you, is worth taking. Because a head of product role, if you haven't done it before, is almost impossible. It's a real catch-22 as an external candidate. Number two was around having the product manager report into me. This is going to be a stepping stone role. Okay, so I knew I wanted to do the role really, really well and then get to the head of product role as fast as possible so I could start having the kind of impact I've been wanting to have. I know I could lead by influence, but I also know it's a lot easier with positional authority to make changes really quickly. I've learned that in the past. Like, like hierarchies do still matter, even if they are quite a flat organization. And I also need to prove that I could line manage. Going back to what I said earlier about, unless you've been a product manager, you can't line manage them. Unless I had opportunities to line manage people, I couldn't show that I was good at that. And I thought a lot of people were really bad at that, and therefore I wanted to show it really quickly. 
And so we debated, a JD was created before I actually joined and shared with me what's the world going to look like. This is all part of negotiations. At some point it went a little bit sideways. Suddenly I was once again coaching the product managers rather than managing the product managers. That happens in negotiations. And I said, hang on, I thought I was going to manage the product managers. What's going on? It turns out there was someone already there who was managing the product managers. And it was a bit awkward. He said, well, you can have half each. I said, okay, no worries. Two people to manage is enough to show my skills. Thirdly, values check. And again, I'm not going to preach this room about values, but I've learned I will always pick my own values over the company's values. And as I get older and wiser, I do this even more, not less. So I need to work in places where we're pretty aligned to avoid conflict. Luckily, these really well align with my own values. And so we had a match. And then it was about, do they live them? I'd worked in a bunch of places where they're on the wall, but no one's doing them. And that cognitive dissonance really wound me up. I can't handle that as a person. I just point at the wall and go, but I don't understand why we aren't doing the thing we say we're doing. I was really lucky. I had a friend working there already. It was actually the friend who already managing the product managers. That's what another day. I said to him, hey, do you think I'd fit in well there? Which is my way of saying, do you think it's a good values fit? Are they living the values? I also gave a phone call with him to ask him about that. And he said, yeah, you love it there. So did my values check. And then fourth, make sure you can succeed. If you are going to take on this role, this jump, it's a big jump, gone from a big company to a small company to try and get that progression quickly, make sure the challenge you're set is solvable. Make sure it's not a shit show and make sure you can do the thing they need. Luckily, working out a set ambitious but sustainable delivery pace is a thing I'd done before at least more than once. And so that was a problem I knew loads about and was really confident that I could help them with, especially this moving from one team to four teams. That is a classic coaching problem. And it worked. It worked really well. Um, I was make a really great impact. Loads of luck, to be clear. And I'm taking a snapshot of this story here, right? Any success story has a whole ton of luck. Uh, weirdly, COVID actually helped me. I was in the office more with a small group of people, all those kind of things. But it went pretty well. And after three months, I was able to make the jump from product delivery lead to head of product. I went to them and said, hey, the job I'm doing is actually a head of product role. You just don't really realize it. The main reason they wouldn't give it to me in the first place, it turns out, was actually why that meant that I wanted to own the vision. And I was like, no, no, you as a CEO, you own the vision, let me run the machine, make all this stuff work. That is what a head of product often is end up doing. And then later on moved to VP product. Also, whilst I was there, I said, hey, there's this executive team. It's not called that, but I, I'm not on it. And it'd be really helpful if I am on it because I want to make quite a few changes to just product and also the organization as a whole. And when you have that moment of being like, they think you're good, they must do because they, they're going to promote you, now's the time to ask. Uh, and so I did. I, I poked until they said, yeah, like, go, have a go. Uh, and I'm now on this team. Um, and it's really, really transformational for my own happiness. Because as an agile coach, a lot of the functions you have, you're often bounded by the layer you're working in organizationally. And that can be quite frustrating because you can see the problem, but you aren't able to go and fix it. And now I was in the room to be able to actually go after any problem the company had. Any cultural problem that came up came via this team. I could say, oh, maybe we shouldn't do that about annual leave policy because that thing will actually affect delivery. Because all the policies affect delivery, but often you're just stuck in those policies that surround you. Well, now I could challenge them. Uh, and I was really happy about that. And I definitely tried to bring some energy into it. Uh, that power thing, I now had more power as well. And I made it pretty clear pretty early on as well that if this was going to work, there'd be some change about how the team was operating. I was able to then turn a group of people into a team. And so I made the move. I now had my shot. I'd done these four things amongst other things and I was ready to take it on. And this is all around hyperscaling. So this is a very um, scary gif, uh, but it is how it feels if you've worked in startups, right? It is quick, it's furious, it's going on. And the really important part about this, this final point I'm going to make is around get things to 7 out of 10. Do not, when you see a first problem, don't try and get it to 10 out of 10 because you simply haven't got time. Get things to 7 out of 10 and move on to the next problem because there's going to be so many more coming your way. And this is still true today because we're still hyperscaling. Um, and these are the four things I focused on. Now, obviously, these are specific to my context. I'm not saying they're true for your context, but maybe it can help jog some things in your own brain. So first of all, hiring was a mess. 
They were not written down the process. It was just a CEO did a thing. There'd been some good hires, some bad hires. There was no way of understanding how it was happening. It was very ad hoc, classic kind of early stage startup stuff. So first things first, it sounds stupid. Just write down the process as it should be, or at least as it is before you make changes to it. Secondly, add a few different rules you learn from previous experience. I learned that pairing was incredibly powerful as an agile coach. I always thought it'd be true for all hiring, was now just to bring it in. Everything we do is paired because you've got bias, they've got bias, you're having a bad day, and they're having a bad day. Hopefully with two of you, you can make a better decision. And then much later on, this time we brought in about six months ago, we now also make our product managers walk the walk. Something I learned as a coach at Spotify was making people run a retrospective as part of the interview process. And that was really powerful learning for me. And so now as product managers, if you come and work for us, you have to run a team's planning session, a real team's planning session. You have to turn up and run it. And it's very uh, insightful to see who can do that and who can't. Two, maybe again, this sounds really obvious, there was no progression frameworks. There was no way of measuring anyone's performance. Performance is measured about how well you lived the five values, which is cool, but not necessarily very useful for product management. Um, get something in, seven out of 10, and get going. Third, you've probably worked out by this point, three months in, I was lucky in some ways, I wasn't in the role, I had some time to work out the problems, what's going wrong? We didn't have a clear process for how we're doing product. So I kind of invented one, slash invented, stole from other people various bits, um, and got our product managers all focused around doing these things. And finally, around trying to do a great job at being the head of product, was around vertical alignment. Now this is a graph everyone in this room has probably seen before, and notoriously much harder to do, and it's a balancing act. You're never gonna win at this, you're always trying to balance autonomy and alignment. You've gotta remember, only a year earlier, that was the entire company. Okay, they were one product team. They had built everything and it was their baby. And they were finding it incredibly hard to move away from being the product team to letting the teams have some version of autonomy. And that was mostly the reason they couldn't move from one team to four teams, who'd have guessed it. So we had to create a way of having vertical, had to create trust between those different layers of the organization that now existed. And so we created really simple check-ins. Almost all companies have something like this where People get in a room together, the PM and the team present and say, here's what we're working on, here's what's next, here's how you can help. And then afterwards, they post the slides in a Slatchedal and say, in case you missed it, here's what happened, please ask any questions you want. And then you just argue about whether or not it's happening one week, two weeks, or three weeks. And as you get bigger, more mature, you can spread those different check-ins out. And that's it. That's it for today. Uh, I know it's a bit of a whirlwind of different things, just to recap, in case you want to, these are the 12 steps that I took to move from, as I or things I learned to get from A to B. These are the four things I did once I got there to make sure it's successful. And if you do want to come and work for AccuREx, we do have jobs available. Uh, you can just Google us and have a look online, especially if you're an engineer. We've got loads of jobs in general across the board. And that's it. Thanks very much.